Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Hot Pot Talks. Um, my name is David Ng, and I'm here with my dear friend and longtime uh, creative partner, Jen Sangshine. Um, you might know us as the co-founders and co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, um, a media arts collective that produces documentary films about QT BIPOCs um, in our community. Um, we're also members of the Vancouver Artist Labor Union Cooperative, uh, also known as Value Co-op. Um, before we begin today, I wanted to acknowledge that Jen and I are beaming uh, this live uh, stream from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Squamish, uh, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, and I also wanted to begin today by um, highlight highlighting the work of the Braided Warriors, um, who are a group of Indigenous youth in these territories who are defending the land and people from ca capitalist colonial violence. Um, they're currently raising funds to support land defenders who were arrested a few weeks ago. Um, so if you have the means, um, you can send them funds through PayPal, um, and my colleague Cameron is going to drop the uh, PayPal link um, in the comments so you can uh, click and go straight through to PayPal. So you should know this by now, Hot Pot Talks is a weekly series live streaming to YouTube and Facebook every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, where we have free-flowing conversations with artists, activists, chefs, performers, poets, and community organizers about what it means to be an artist facing today's realities, what ethical responsibilities do we have as artists? What community organizing and art making looks like during quarantine, all the while sharing our favorite hot pot ingredients. Yeah, so um, why Hot Pot Talks? I've, I've mentioned this a few times, but especially um, because today's conversation um, is with T-Base and, you know, we wanted to talk about their work in, in Chinatown. I wanted to highlight again, um, this this idea of Hot Pot Talks came from the fact that um, Value Co-op, Value Co-op, our studio is in the Lim Sai Hor Kam Mok Society building. Um, and when we, when we were moving into Chinatown, and recognizing the ways that artists have contributed to gentrification. Um, we had long conversations about how we could be proactive and generative in building reciprocal relationships in the community. Um, and so through our community projects working group, which Jen and I are a part of, um, we're doing a collaboration with the Lim Association elders um, uh, the, and their board on a project called Engaging Chinatown, um, where we're gonna be digitizing their archives. Um, and then the original idea was we were gonna turn it into an immersive uh, visual art exhibit, um, but unfortunately COVID had other ideas or is pushing us to reimagine um, those uh, pieces of community connection that we wanted to, to do. Um, and so Hot Pot Talks is a part of, um, of this reimagining of how we can connect to with people um, about these issues related to Chinatown um, and culture and, and other, other topics. So in thinking about these themes of nourishment and love, um, we want to plug our limited edition tote bags, which are available for purchase um, that David will be holding up right now. Have you eaten today simply means I love you in BIPOC language. A simple question asked by so many of our parents, elders, and aunties everywhere, which evokes a shared familial understanding of love and tenderness. These feelings of unspoken care inspire Hot Pot Talks, where culture and community nourish our bodies and our hearts too. Um, before we welcome T-Base, I wanted to thank our incredible team of Praticum students who have made this Hot Pot series a possibility. Thank you, Lamia, Cameron, Ava, Yeska, and Victoria. Um, so without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce Hanya and Jay from T-Base. Welcome both. Hello. Hi. 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 We're so excited to talk with you guys. Um, <laughs> so much for having us. Yeah, we're, um, and you know, Hanya, we were just talking um, just before uh, before we streamed, um, or before we went live, and we felt it was really important just to start right off the bat to um, acknowledge and honor the lives that were lost in Atlanta today, um, and thinking about in thinking about ongoing anti Asian racism but also thinking about the experiences of working class Asian Asians in, and in, in Chinatowns across the world. Um, Hany, is there anything that you wanted to, to add to that? Yeah, I guess like, I think everyone is devastated. You know, I spent the night sobbing. <laughs> and um, like, I guess a tweet that Lorraine made, who is a FOCT member that I think was is really well put is like, the flattening of last night's events in Atlanta by the upper and middle class people, Asian people, uh, into this blanket of anti-Asian racism and I am not the uh, virus. This narrative really erases the specificity of this kind of violence against low wage massage parlor workers. Uh, and it's like, 
not just an isolated incident, like the shooter was not just a sex addict having a bad day, you know, like it happens yeah. everywhere in Canada, all over the world, violence and racism against working class women, uh, sex workers, it's historic. And I think another tweet that I think also really eloquently kind of encapsulates this as like a legislative historical thing is that the fetishistic, fetishistic, anti-Asian misogyny apparently espoused by the Atlanta shooter can't be removed from the context of the empire. Like it is US imperialism, which frames Asian women as open to mili militarized sexual conquest, conquest. Uh, and the US military remains a central purveyor of sexual violence in Asia, you know? Mm -hmm. And like this conversation tonight is about, yeah, like complicating Chinatown, complicating artists, you know, in Chinatown. Um, and like, th that's like the definition of like queering as a political framework. And yeah, Chinatown is not just Chinese people. Chinatown's not a monolith. Massage parlors mm -hmm. uh, and workers are part of this conversation. And like, we need to platform them, platform them right now and take their lead and help advocate for their rights and safety. Um, I, I wonder if we, before we get too deep into it, Hania, thank you, um, if we could maybe start with a moment of silence and then we can get into the conversations of complicating Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah, let's start a moment of silence, please, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just, I'm just so enraged. You know what I mean? I'm just like, yeah. I'm so angry and like, yeah, I guess it's like, we can talk the talk, but like we gotta walk the walk and like, you know, giving platforming organizations like here in Toronto, um, it's like Butterfly, which is specifically Asian and migrant um, sex workers. Um, and then Maggie's, which is like an over kind of more umbrella, like sex workers uh, support network. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm thinking about the work of Wish as well, and even mm -hmm. Weva um, in Vancouver as well, supporting sex workers here. We actually, um, it's it's no longer um, a running organization. It's defunct now, but I used to work at um, Asia, which stands for the Asian Society for the Intervention of AIDS. And they had a um, dedicated program uh, uh, working to support, um, yeah, massage parlors, um, in the kind of surrounding Vancouver area and the Tri Cities, and, um, and 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 they did really amazing work. But you know, and this was one of the conversations that we were hoping to have with you today because we wanted to talk about, you know, originally when we invited you, we we wanted to contrast the um, kind of the, the the Toronto and Vancouver conversations and kind of um, you know um, compare notes, right? Uh, because one of the things that David and I have um, noticed over the past mm -hmm. like 10 years where there's just been people come to Vancouver and they're wondering where are the queer Asian organizations and um, unfortunately there are just n none that I can think of right David yeah I, I, Jen I never knew you, I didn't know you worked for Asia yeah that was like one of my amazing. first jobs <laughs> oh, that's amazing and, yeah. and, and, and this conversation has come up a few times because like People, Jen and I will get e emails about, you know, um, you, people looking for queer Asian organizations and the default is love intersections. And we didn't start love intersections. I mean, we're two Asian, pe queer Asian people, but we didn't sort of start um, love intersections specifically with a focus to support queer Asians. Um, but now we're sort of doing, we're, we're, I guess we're, we're doing that work. Um, but yeah, it's sort of one of the things we are very envious about. Toronto is sort of the, the 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 well, I guess the history and also the a lot of the organizations there that are that seem to be present in terms of supporting the queer Asian community. 
Um, I'm wondering just for our audiences who um, are unfamiliar with the work of T-Base, Hanya and Jay, mm -hmm. um, would you two kindly uh, introduce yourselves and also a little bit about um, you know, what T-Base is? Um, because on your website, uh, it says that you're you're sort of a tea shop, sort of a office, sort of a garden <laughs> club, sort of a venue, sort of a mahjong uh, hall. It's all very like DIY, super DIY. I'm just so curious about what is tea base? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, like I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> 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 like I, I think it's a very like malleable space. It's kind of like you go, it's like I really do joke that we technically shouldn't exist, but we just got our incorporation papers um as a co-op yesterday. <gasps> Congratulations. Yes. So we and I should just, just quickly also make the connection to um we so the last time we chatted, um uh, you guys had reached out to to us because um you were looking into the co-op model and then we just had this we just really hit it off and we were like oh my god we would love to have this conversation again <laughs> exactly but that's so exciting so co new that you got the co-op papers so yeah no now we legally exist oh my god <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. and uh it, yeah, yeah it is so interesting to think about like east and west coast and how like mm -hmm. we kind of were inspired to become a co-op via talking to you but the chinatown histories in both vancouver and toronto are very different and so I guess T-Base was really just like, I came from DIY in Toronto, um, specifically like Blind Canvas in Unit 2. Um, mm -hmm. So I was one of like the few Asians really. And then I was like, wait, what happened? What would happen if we did a DIY space in Chinatown? You know, mm -hmm. and like, I'm just queer. So it just ended up being really queer. It attracted all these other queers. Um, yeah, Jay, I don't know what's like, What's T base? <laughs> what is T base? Um, well, as the technical director, I can describe it technically, I suppose. Um, but T base is really, at least in my experience, a great like launch pad for community building, base building. It's really like through, I guess, its ambiguity, but its specificity in like we're queer Asians. If you're queer and Asian in Canada, you probably know who T base is, you know, and like. <laughs> through that kind of just blanket statement we've come to bring together a lot of people that i probably wouldn't have met otherwise you know like i come i grew up in trinidad trinidad and tobago um and my mom is jamaican chinese and migrated from jamaica to canada met my dad who's trinidadian and moved down to trinidad and that's where they both still live so like my relationship to toronto and chinatown here is very much like peering in like Am I even allowed here? Like, <laughs> is this is this okay for me to take up space here? And like, T base really kind of like welcomed me with open arms. And everything that I put into T base, I got all back and more. Not even as like a transactional, but more so just like community investment. And I think that's really the the beauty and the truth of what T base is. It's just like you know, um, people looking out for each other and taking care of each other and thinking of each other. You know. Mm. Mm. You know, love what you said, what you said about like peering in and, 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 you know, am I welcome here? You know, that I, I even though I grew up in, well, I didn't, you know, my, my great grandmother um, lived in an SRO in, in Chinatown. Um, and I, I currently now live like a block away from Chinatown, but, you know, um, my, uh, I had a conversation with Paul Wong a couple months ago and we were talking about how, even though he's in a different generation, his, his family was the, his parents were the ones that left Chinatown, you know, like the ones that, you know, like like my parents too. Well, we have grocery stores in South Vancouver now. We don't need to go to Chinatown. Great grandma passed away. We don't need to go to Chinatown. And we're sort of, Paul and I kind of connected on the sense that we're of that generation that wants to come back. And I've really struggled with it too, because I'm like, well, am I, am I allowed to claim or to be in this space? Um, yeah, and so when we were, in, you know, I mentioned in our intro too, and thinking about, we, we, even like thinking about value co-op moving into Chinatown, even myself, like I, I, I it, yeah, there was a lot of hesitation around um, and thinking through about like, you know, what is my what is my place or can I call um, Chinatown a part of my home? Um, and it's mm -hmm. yeah, something that I've been grappling with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting, like, finding out about, like, the different perspectives and, like, the history of Chinatown, because, yeah, growing up, 
Chinatown was always background for me. Yeah, like my my mom worked in the grocery and grocery stores at Kawe for over 15 years. It was always just like this is where I just go. Things happen here. I don't really care, mm -hmm. you know. And then to choose to make it the foreground, kind of yeah, having a space, um, and like just to expand on tea base a little more. It's very like everyone always comes in and they're like, "What do you sell? What do you open? <laughs> what do you do?" And it's like ah, like. It's weird when to have a space where you don't have to buy anything to exist. Like capitalism doesn't, you know, we don't live in a society where this is normalized unless it's like a park, you know, or so library. or a library, you know, but it's been really interesting that they don't, yeah, they don't teach you about any of this stuff. And then choosing, like making that decision to unearth like mm. the fucking shit and the trauma. And, you know, I think yeah. I'm coming to realize that our generation second third whatever it is that healing it is that unearthing mm. you know and mm. like i uh, chi Yi, another member of fact kind of mm. calls it like the emotional cornerstones of chinatown like mm. bakeries are an emotional cornerstone i think the veggie grannies does vancouver have veggie grannies oh yeah oh yeah yeah <laughs> like <laughs> the bia the business improvement association is like oh the liability of the veggie grannies you know we don't really want them this makes us look dirty and smelly but we're like no yeah. you know and this, it's this new generation this new perspective and it is often like queer people and i, I think yeah. it's also complicating it like queer people who are chinese because they are yeah mm. very homophobic right mm. Um, mm. so a lot of i think queer asian people are like yeah do i even Am I allowed? So I think it's so beautiful that like we love intersections and tea base is making the space, you know, for people to safely kind of unearth their heritage without having to deal with like homophobia. I'm super yeah. curious about, yeah, yeah, like how you like, cause I think it is a conscious decision to kind of come back mm. to Chinatown, you know, and David mm. kind of expanded on yours a little bit. Like I'm super curious about like yours, Jen. I don't really have a relationship to Chinatown growing up. I'm a first generation immigrant um, born in Taiwan. Um, so I didn't move here until I was nine years old. And um, and and that's a whole other story that um, we don't have days to uh, get into. But I will just summarize, uh, I'm an only child and they're uh, Buddhist hippies essentially who um, wanted to shelter me from the dangers of the world um, and human suffering, if you will. And so um, the reason why I think the conversations of queer Asian or ch queer Chinese identities is super um, uh, in, uh, significant in my, in, in kind of like how I think through who I am um, is that it's so um, the often the opposite of what people's presumption and assumptions of of, of, of me, um, you know, so, uh, even though people know me, but I will still get asked like, oh, when you came out, like how mm -hmm. were your parents accepting? And, you know, the kind of the narrative um, has always been centered around that trauma or the potentiality of that trauma. It's just like they want that trauma porn, right? To fit yeah. their ideals or like ideology of what a queer Asian is experiencing. Yeah. Yeah, like it, it, this, it's one actually one of the reasons. It's such a good question because that's actually one of the reasons why we started Love Intersections. I'll, it's a long story, but essentially there was a. I guess Jen, why don't we tell the story? It's it's, it's sure, not I, tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, this was in twenty thirteen. I was sitting in Vancouver. I was sitting in Vancouver. Um, on the, the Vancouver School Board's Pride Advisory Committee at the time, and we were updating a 10-year-old policy. Um, it was a sexual orientation and gender diversity policy um, to make schools safer for transgender students. And um, at the time, we were heavily protested. And David and I are very deliberate, but also careful in naming who it was that protested us. And they were um, Chinese conservative Christian parents. Um, and those were very long school board meetings because so many people, um, you know, signed up either to speak either for or against this policy update. Um, and so I always tell the story by placing myself in those rooms where I'm sitting with my com so-called queer communities and allies behind me and, you know, with our rainbow placards and signs and sitting directly across from me were people that look like me, that could be my parents' age and my grandparents. Um, and 
So after that controversial kind of experience, what David and I noticed was the ways in which the white media reported on this controversy was super, quite frankly, very racist because they painted Chinese people as like a monolith. Um, the headline literally said, you know, um, ethnic, they use the word ethnic, ethnic Chinese protest LGBT policies again. And like Jen and I were just like, what the fuck, right? Yeah. Like, and, <laughs> yeah. And we, so we, we, sorry, David, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to, you know, in, I, I grew up in an evangelical Christian home and I know this community very well. My parents have been very, very accepting of me and my partner and the narrative on all sides, Jen and I were just like, we are not in any, we're not, we're not being heard in any of these, these, um, in the media, you know, I'm, I'm the, the media is also erasing the fact that there, at the time I was still identifying as a Christian, there are queer Chinese Christians that exist too. Um, you know, the, we just didn't see ourselves um, uh, represented. But Jen, and, I think- it, Yeah, right. well, we wanted to just essentially like write a blog. And so we, we wrote a couple blogs, They a few of them went viral to kind of talk about our experiences, um, kind of talking about the intersectionality of like spirituality and um, race and gender and sexuality. Um, and, and that was the, the, the impetus for us to start Love Intersections because what we noticed that was the common denominator between the us and the them was the love piece, right? That these parents were there because they loved their children. Um, and the parents on our side loved their children. And so we really wanted to draw out the love at the intersection where we're all meeting. And that is, that's how love intersections started. And then soon <laughs> after that, we started making videos. <laughs> <laughs> And that was seven years ago. My gosh. Wow. Yeah. It's been seven years. I don't know. It's it's seven, seven years. years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Leon's here. I love, <laughs> I love Leon. Leon, if you follow them, they post very visceral photos of them crying. And it is grounding in the most unexpected way. It's really beautiful. Like, I encourage you to follow them just to like hold some tears with them. Mm. I love that. I love that. I, I'm constantly crying She's great. so um yeah. that will be very <laughs> affirming I like normalize crying on the timeline you know yes. like she really does that and <laughs> mm -hmm. that's thank you for sharing the origin story and it's true it's like everyone thinks it's like ugh, like cr crazy i need to stop saying crazy in my vocabulary wild thought not all asian people are chinese new thought right not all yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I don't know why that is so hard to comprehend because let's complicate Chinatown. In our Chinatown yeah. specifically, it's a lot of international students, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not cheap to be an international student. And so Chinatown in Toronto is becoming arguably more Chinese, but less Chinatown. Mm. That's so mm. complicated. You know what I mean? Like the gentrification yeah. of Chinatown is almost being done by these mainland franchises. So mm -hmm. like, right. it's so wow. complicated, you know? And even like, yeah. I've, I've just been doing some research, like even when people were demanding for redress, huge divide, right? You had like mm. people who were like, you had people who were like, give us our fucking money back. Mm -hmm. And then you yeah. had people who were like, shut up, work hard keep your head down, yeah. which I think is this right. like, kind of tension that we're talking about. Um, and like, I don't know, I'm super curious because like you're in your family association, right, David? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you I mean, patri patriarchy is fucked up, but it's technically, <laughs> that's, that's my mom. It's on my mom's lineage. So technically not mine, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> like that's so no, stupid. That's so stupid. So like, I don't know. I just want to hear about like what has been your experience queering, like literally just taking up space, like queering Chinatown, even though maybe you didn't like think about it when you guys yeah. started seven years ago. But like, I think the the history of Vancouver Chinatown and Toronto Chinatown are just very different. You know, even though like mm -hmm. we're queer people taking up space in Chinatown, I'd love to hear about like if you've had to like butt heads with you know like the bia or like i don't know i just want to hear about yeah. what that's been like well there's a i mean so 
Paul Wong does, or it, it's not, he's, he's run a Pride in Chinatown in Vancouver um, at the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Gardens. Um, he has a partnership with them. He, had, he did a residency there um, and uh, did a, produce a, a, a bunch of amazing work and also this event, um, this amazing event. Um, um, he hired uh, the House of Rice, which is a, a Asian uh, drag troupe in, in Vancouver. Um, and last year, he invited a bunch of Asian artists, including uh, myself and Value Co-op, um, to, they did like, instead, of course, we couldn't have an event last summer, um, but they, uh, they we, we did like a, a walking a walking tour of, sorry, David, use your words. <laughs> we did we, we did window displays um, throughout Chinatown, um, and people could you know view them at whatever time that they that they wanted, and the piece that I did um, the 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 elders on the Lim Association board had shown me this um, this article about because uh, on the second floor there was a uh, of the building it used to be a bathhouse for uh, laborers, and. It's a really racist article. Like it basically, it, I think it says something like "big cleanup for Chinese" or some mm. stuff like that, right? But when you when you read the article, like if you read like behind what the the Chinese Empire Reform Society, so they were the original occupants or the um, people who built that building, they were building it. Like there there was this there's a, like very clear like they were trying to make an intervention on the the racism against Chinese people. Like they had put out this, they built this bathhouse and they really wanted to, to you know, for whatever reason, very clear to me, um, community um, building aspects of it, like camaraderie, right? And so, and what's interesting, the, the word comrade, um, and there's a lot of history about, about this word in Chinese, but the word well, comrade, gay. it means gay. <laughs> it means gay. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I was playing around with this idea of camaraderie and the word comrade um, and queerness, um, and I also inserted the 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 the, the um, Hong Kong orchid around it because it was at the time of the Hong, the resistance the, or the a lot of the um, resistance uh, movements in in Hong Kong, and I was really 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 nervous about it because I really didn't know how it would be received too um especially you know hearing from paul that he had he had printed out these stickers that said pride in chinatown and just went around walked around in businesses and love paul and his persistence because every year he does this and he keeps getting rejected by the businesses over and over and over again they won't even put up the sticker um and so i forgot the original questions but part of like in in terms of thinking about there's a lot of i i, I i'm i'm I, I wait, wait, so, wait, wait, so you put up the, the piece, what was the reaction? Like, how was it received? Were people like, no? Or, or I guess, did you get to, like, talk to, I get, like... I did, I mean, they were, they were very, I mean, they were very happy that we were, like, the, 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 the association was like, oh, it's really cool that you're engaging with the history. I didn't hear, there was, I didn't hear any negative um, stuff from the community, um, but I'm not, yeah, I'm, I do feel that there is a, there is an awkwardness um, around it. Just going back to, you know, I, when we started Love Intersections, it was also a controversy of these um, school board people that were had were quite um, homophobic um, and they got ousted on the school board. And like, I remember, Jen, when we started Love Intersections and we were filming and we would see posters of these people mm -hmm. in the, the shops that we were filming at, right? <laughs> Supporting them, right? And so, you know, and, Jen and I were talking about earlier today, it was part of, we, we, we didn't really center this when we started Love Intersections because we wanted to challenge the systemic racism, but we also, there's a part of it that it's like, we want our community to, we want to be, be visible in as queer in, in our community too, right? In, in the Chinese community too. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's really, so sorry, Hanya, go ahead. No, you go. I, I was just saying because uh, I'm, I'm really ruminating on your question around you know this the it's my relationship to to Chinatown and um, what's so unique I think about Vancouver's Chinatown is that it borders um, the downtown east side it also mm -hmm. includes and borders um, what was now what was once Hogan's Alley although it's still there but it's it was historically predominantly mm -hmm. a black community that was there but of course gentrification pushed them out. Um, so all of these kind of communities all interwoven, enmeshed, and like next to each other in a relatively small, you know, three, four block radius, right? 
Um, mm -hmm. But my relationship has always been, um, you know, like I would attend the Queer Film Festival, which had, which would have screen movies um, in in um, the oh International Village, which is right in Chinatown. Um, and then right next to it is a TNT, which is our like Asian grocers. So like, it's so, it's such a like an intrinsic part of like queer activism for me because I started working um, pretty early on in my twenties where um, then I was spent so much of my time in Chinatown or the or proximity. Um, and then I would like walk to work and I would just like cross through Chinatown and get my veggies on my way home you know, and, and so that's always been my, it's, it's always been experiential, but I haven't really like thought very artistically or even philosophically about what is my relationship to Chinatown when I don't have that historical narrative that many people do. And I am also quite frankly, really like, and it feels very vulnerable to, to, to say this uh, live streaming, um, but I am also very scared of the, like the territorial, stuff that goes on in Chinatown, who gets to organize in Chinatown, who gets to do activism in Chinatown, because there's so, it's such a complicated, not everyone agrees with each other on that stuff, right? And so I, I, I know sometimes it can be very territorial and I don't want to like step on anyone's toes. Especially in Vancouver, because I think Vancouver's Chinatown is historically like older and there's just been more, as far as I know, like more how I understand like more organizing in Chinatown and actually like yeah. I don't know I'm gonna butcher this but I think there was a site fight over a parking lot right in Vancouver Chinatown oh and there was a huge divide because one I'm gonna I don't want to butcher this please I'm, I'm just gonna say right now I might be wrong but I think there was a divide what really kind of divided the community was one group was anti-sex worker and yeah. one group was pro sex work, and yeah. right? Am I? Do you know? Yeah. Well, it's it's the same. I, 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 Hani, I think you mentioned this too, and I'm curious to hear more about your experiences in Toronto. But like, there's a lot of like, as Jen mentioned, it's where Chinatown is, sit is situated in Vancouver. There's a bit. There is a, a a voice of we need to clean up Chinatown, right? Very much welcoming in <laughs> gentrification, actually, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and and all of that that's loaded in, into that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, what has been the experience in Toronto? How has your your work, um, Jay and Hania, been received in, in, in Toronto? It's definitely a mixed bag. Um, <laughs> just like how in Vancouver, you're saying like, you know, gentrification is kind of like with open arms, like Chinatown is one of it, like the BIA in our Chinatown is very much like, yeah, no, Gentrification is good, actually. Like we love it. We we need it. Like we want to like yeah. be up on that level. So it's like we're kind of. <laughs> and this this goes back to like you know Chinatown Chinese people, Asian people. We're not a monolith. You know we all have very differing opinions, um, different views. And the work that we've done so far, I think the people who need it have valued it more than anything else. And the people who don't, just kind of have a frown on their face. You know, um, it's kind of like. That's the beautiful thing about art is like it's out there and you experience it, it, it. People experience it and they form their own opinions, emotional responses that kind of like start the conversation. And like I think that more than anything else, then like the reception is kind of where we need to be going because, you know, like a lot of Asian people, we don't talk about it <laughs> in general. Okay. We just don't talk about it. And I think the, the work that T-Base does has really gone a long way to starting conversations. Well, I love your relationship to Chinatown, Jay, because like I was kind of like born and raised in the neighborhood. So like I have a very long relationship. Right. Whereas like you're like third gen Jamaican Chinese. Like I'm super curious, like Mouthful. what a year, I guess two years later, you know, that you've been kind of with T-Base. Like what is your relationship to Chinatown? I'm super curious. Well, I guess I'd have to start with like my, I guess, ancestral relation where it's like, my family crossed the ocean. I think ours was actually the Atlantic because most most people cross the Pacific. But we came across the Atlantic to the Caribbean, some as indentured servants and some as just people looking for opportunities. And my family came across and for the most part, we were like, not even like a Chinatown. We went to like small towns across the Caribbean 
and it was more like we were the Chinese shop and like you anything you wanted and especially if you didn't have the money to front the Chinese shop would lend you you know like there's stories of my like great grandfather like giving too much away and like my my great grandmother having to chase down people for money because he just keeps giving away free rice because <laughs> people can't afford <laughs> it you know so <laughs> like that's kind of where I come from where it's not even like I had like a whole community but it's like we were almost like a focal point in like um villages so like uh Stav Lamar Savannah Lamar in Jamaica which is kind of like the the sticks of Jamaica um is where like we kind of base and then because of the rise of violence and like um post-colonial like tensions like my family then moved to Canada and they kind of found a new niche there. Like my family is predominantly like in Ajax, Pickering, Oshawa area these days. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually like, so I live at Young and Finch right now and my grandmother used to have a shop at Young and Shepherd. And now it's gentrified mm -hmm. as hell. Like it, it's so wow. hostile and inhuman, but it's like my, my grandmother had a textile shop in there, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I've come from with regards to Chinatown. It wasn't like so much like full community, but like we were like focal points in the communities that we occupied. Mm. And then like two years into being part of Chinatown and like going back to like not really feeling accepted, but also like very much like a, this is a lot of new things, it's scary. I am, I don't know where to begin. Like <laughs> my relationship with T-Base and then by extension Chinatown, I've really come to like know and have very like, I guess intimate business relationships with the businesses there, like um, Bruce and Ah Ling, who run a little like um, food shop in the Chinatown Mall. It's like that held me through last summer. Uh, not even last summer, mm. summer before. It's like I would have fried rice with shrimp every day. <laughs> like that, mm. that was my meal. That was my staple. Like I would start and end my day with that. And like, yeah, like I guess like. I remember, and if you know this Chinatown, how it is right now, like before I became part of it, the only place I really knew was August 8th, <laughs> which <laughs> is just like the most like, oh, I like sushi. So I'm going to go to the sushi spot, you know, and it's like the overpriced $35 and not, $35 for a full thing. And that was like my only relationship to Chinatown. And now it's like, I know spots, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> there's like I love food. that. There's I ball love that. Food, you know, there's um what is it? There's two fo shop, Faux Pasteur, shout out them, you know. They have some eccentric people working there that I really like. And um <laughs> what is it? Fo Hung, Saigon Lotus, you know, Hong Kong bakery. I could go on. But yeah, it's like now, if anything, it it doesn't just feel like I know it, it's like people know me, and that's really cool, you know. Right. I love that T Bank has been able to do that. And it's like, I think what it is, it's like, it's we see it across Turtle Island, right? Like it's migration, gentrification, displacement, and then assimilation. And it's like before Chinatown was Chinatown, everyone kind of migrated from the ward, which was like the city's first slum, obviously deemed by the government. So it was Jewish people who kind of had Chinatown and Kensington Market, and then they moved to the suburbs. And then Chinese people came in and now they've all moved to the suburbs. And like, I guess I think the people who are still in Chinatown and especially second generations, I think are recognizing that it's changing. And so mm. I think about the BIA, it's like, they understand that Chinatown is changing and their, their way of like keeping it or maintaining it is more money, more business, gentrify us, please. You know, yeah. and then the our kind of our like second gen or like the T base, you know, uh, this kind of group is like we understand that Chinatown is changing, and we want to keep it by maintaining its like working class values and the veggie grannies. Like, you know, we want to like right. subvert this stinky, dirty, fucking stereotype. You know, but it's like I guess yeah. I guess it's like a generational difference, and it is. I think the work right now is doing that bridge building. Like I, I make a joke about how like the BIA, like if if, if T-Base and Fox can build a relationship with the BIA, it's like, then that means I can do it with my parents. <laughs> 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 Listen, honey, aren't we all just doing all of this, any of this to do some ther like internal therapy to get us to be able to like talk to our parents um we joked about this with uh, the aya collective where we're like how do we ask these questions to our parents because we don't know how and so we work out we workshop it with each other 
Um. <laughs> yeah, we like organized in Chinatown so that we can talk to each other about it. And like, yeah. it's so interesting. My mom, like I love my mom. She has like really progressive like gender politics. It's amazing. Like I came out to my mom. So my coming out story, we were going up the escalator to see Crazy Rich Asians. So my coming out story lasted about 15 seconds. <laughs> and the conversation was like, I was like, mom, what are your thoughts on like the gentrification of Chinatown? She was like, whatever, you know, I don't really want to judge anyone. Like anyone can come in. I don't care. I was like, okay, you don't care. So what if I was like into uh, girls? <laughs> <laughs> and she was That's like, amazing. she was like, yeah, I wouldn't really care either. And I was like, okay, well, I'm into girls. And she was like, yeah, that's fine. And that was it. <laughs> 15 seconds and then, we, and then we watched crazy rich asians oh my god that's hilarious <laughs> my mom has like really conservative politics too like we'll debate over like prison abolition you know like mm -hmm. and it gets really heated it's complicated and like i don't know what are your thoughts on that <laughs> you know it's oh, funny. I, my, my well my parents were my mom was I, well they she had met my partners like prior to this but, but what really became an issue, and this is, and this is maybe a, a note on, on the religion aspect, it didn't become an issue until I moved in with my first partner. And then it was like, mm, okay, yeah. this is real now. You know? <laughs> like, and I can just pretend to be okay with it. Yeah. And it was like, it's, it's this, it's this idea of like, you know, even like my, my sister who's straight, like, and un, until the ring is on the finger, your partner is a friend right um they just call every it's just, it's just your friend until there's a ring on your finger right mm -hmm. and, and you don't like you know and my parents never like they didn't leave their parents home until they got married right in fact actually i think they got married and then they still lived with my dad's parents to save money to to buy a house <laughs> so it's sort of like you don't you know the, you don't leave your home until you you get married that sort of thing so yeah, that was sort of the 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 most tension that we had around me coming out was when it or when it became real to them. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious. So, uh, Hannah, you when in the beginning of this conversation, you had mentioned like this the complicating Chinatown um, th this theme, and I Karen Tam last week mentioned the Chinatown Biennale. Are you? Are you involved in this at all? Because I was reading the description, and I was like, "This is a this is interesting. This idea of complicating um, Chinatowns and like thinking about how like the the themes of Chinatown and other ways of just the sort of the, the ways that we're we've been talking or that oftentimes it's talked about." I'm I'm curious. I'm just curious about. It. I just came across the Biennale. Totally, I've never heard it pronounced Biennale. I call oh, is it? it? I I say biennial. I like Biennale. I like it. Is it, is it. I've heard B. No, no, no. Biennial. When I'm in Europe, it's Biennale. Oh. Uh, uh, European pronunciation. pronunciation, yes. Yeah, I think there's a European pronunciation as Biennale, but I think oh. there's, there's different versions of it. Biennale. Okay, I just fancier. I blame it on being ESL. Like Tarje, you know? Like, yeah. Tarje. <laughs> yeah, it's like Value Village is Vulu Village. Village. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so it's so interesting because it's like, I'm not part of the Chinatown Biennial. That's a project led by Arezu and uh, Arezu Salantare and Florence of the Rice Water Collective, but they're both part of T-Base. But this is not a T-Base project. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I just because the th I, I after I read that that description, I it's ma been making me think about um, this complicating Chinatown. So I I just thought maybe that might have been a connection. But, uh. Yeah, I mean, like it definitely, it's all connected, right? They all come from the same mm -hmm. conversations. People are always like, "Is Fox T based? Is T based Fox? Is the Chinatown Biennial?" You know what I mean? And it's like it's just so interesting because it's like they're all interconnected they're all related but they're also their own entities and i think this kind of is a great segue into diy culture and like as i think this uh, as cultural workers i think and as jay and i come from diy so we grow horizontally that's the whole point the whole point is that people join t-base and they're like i want to start my own thing i want to do something else i want to do this instead you know i want to hyper focus on this and that is the whole point and i guess like Maybe this part of the conversation is around like labor as cultural workers and just being like undervalued. And then also like there's a piece about it within the mechanism of gentrification. Mm -hmm. And then there's also 
like yeah, I don't know. I think everyone understands DIY different too. Like, you know, because mm. it is do it yourself. And I, as Rosina would say from unit two, it's do it together. Mm. You know, it's this whole culture of like, we need to survive together because the whole system is going to, it exploits us. And so let's, I guess like, it's like almost like let's exploit ourselves, but on our own terms. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I want to open it up to like what no. everyone's thoughts are yeah. on DIY. That's very on. Uh, that's very insightful. Um, so I, how do I even get into it? Because I think like for me, I also consider myself part of the DIY culture and cultural worker. But more and more, I'm realizing that the self exploitation piece is something that I've grown to like i just accept that it's just part of the gig economy that it's just part of the 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 landscape that we're all part of and one could argue even though you know doi is very it has its like punk rock roots um it's it's very anti-establishment but one could argue that now in today's like kind of climate diy has become mainstream where you know, even t five, 10 years ago, five years ago, underground culture, raves, uh, DIY shows, like uh, all of that stuff um, were able to successfully like remain underground, but it's become increasingly hard now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think I'm just adding to the, the, the complications of-, of Yeah, the, it's yeah. like all of this language gets appropriated. Totally, was, totally. Like, I went to, I was in Shoppers and there was a makeup brand called Revolution. Oh my God! Of you know what I mean? Of course there is. Of course there is. <laughs> of course. What is exactly. the phrase? It's a function of capitalism to co-opt counterculture and make it profitable. Yeah. So yeah. it's just a slow crawl towards, and I guess that's the real beauty of true DIY cultures. It's like, and what my mom has always said about me is like, as soon as something gets popular, I'm out of it. You know, yeah. like I'm yeah. on to the next thing. And to expand yeah. on like the complicating Chinatown, I think it's really like kind of a beautiful thing. Um, the horizontal aspect of DIY and T base as well, where it's like the complication comes from, yeah, we come together and then we kind of like pair off into what we're passionate about. And then at first it was just T base, but now there's what, like three of us, three organizations that can all like have a seat at the table and like really focus on what we think is important as opposed to T base trying to cover all the bases. And I think that's a really powerful part of like complicating Chinatown. Yeah. yeah you know, Go ahead, Jen, because I'm going to I'm picking up on something else. <laughs> oh, OK. I, I was I was just going to make a joke about how even though we move laterally, that does not mean we don't have conflict and have just as much infighting. Um, so I was going to make a terrible joke about that. But we'll <laughs> have something more insightful to add. Irony is not lost well, here. By all means. I was actually, we're thinking, because I was actually <laughs> going to mention something similar, because one of the things that we, uh, I think we actually t talked about this, Hania, as well, is like, one of the, one of the differences in terms of how we organize at Value Co-op, from what I'm seeing how you guys are organizing at T-Base, we started Value Co-op, for example, with most of us not knowing each other. We all, we knew, we, but most of us hadn't really worked together. We kind of didn't really know each other a lot of us, but we, and we spent a lot of time building this, 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 this thing. Um, and th there's, there's, that has implications, right? In terms of the, your relational foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, but I'm also thinking about, um, because it sounds like um, for T-Base, you, you guys kind of did the opposite. You guys just did the thing um, and uh, had relationships first and then are now thinking about how, how to sort of structure this. Um, yeah, I'm curious how, how that process evolved into um, where you guys are at now? Well, because I think what's, I think what David is trying to like, the, the differentiate is that um, for me, my, my experience with like my DIY group of people is that we start out as friends in it together. And then we start thinking about how do we build towards something and create more structure around it and actually set those parameters. And I think what David was saying in terms of like the, how value was formed, um, uh, we we brought in you know a group of artists, complicated artists with different personalities, and you bring them together, and um, and then you started you know started this. <laughs> so it's so and then you worked on those values together. So it's it's the, there's like a difference there. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about your experience. 
Yeah, it's like the reverse. It's like yeah. we're like doing the same thing, but in reverse, yeah. and it has its cons and pros. Yeah. Like it's so funny because when we started T Base, it wasn't like, oh, let's make money, let's make sure labor is paid. It was like, let's just make this shit up. And um, only now are we like, oh, wait, we didn't start this with making money in mind. So now we're playing catch up with like a business plan and all this yeah. stuff. And um, yeah, I guess Kai Ching, have you got, you guys interviewed Kai Ching already, right? Kai Ching okay. was first. So I recently finished her book and Kai Ching like really eloquently put how like people from queer communities uh, who are from small towns come to the big city to find their perfect mm. utopian conflictless, you know, queer community. <laughs> and that like you're setting yourself up for failure because I think what I've yeah. learned is that like community is not some fluffy utopian where everyone loves each other all the time. It's takes a lot of courage to mm -hmm. be accountable to the people you care about. And mm -hmm. especially as queer Asians where our parents, most of our parents never talk to us, never exemplified good boundaries. Don't even have like, you know, my dad only has like two emotions, like anger and happiness. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I think, community is really difficult and that's that's the work of also decolonizing right mm -hmm. and like we talk about it, accessibility and universal design accessibility and decolonizing and complicating chinatown roots itself in relationships and that mm -hmm. shit is so hard yeah and like i know like ebay started in relationships and it is beautiful because i went and partied instead of going to class and so i had all this social capital and i was like fuck it let's use it let's fucking use the social capital and so that's how t-base was born but it's yeah it roots like it really roots itself in relationships and structure is just a tool but at the end of the day it's like can we examine what meaningful connection actually looks like and it's not yeah. happy all the time it is not fluffy it is not you know, love is not some, yeah, not some like, oh, love, choose love, like live, laugh, love. Like, yeah. <laughs> no. I don't yeah. know. What are your thoughts on only. relationships? Yeah. And Jay, yeah. you're new to DIY culture. I'm super curious as to how you complicate relationships, with DIY culture and all that. Um, Not to make this about skateboarding again, but it's a lot like <laughs> skateboarding um, in that, you know, I see something that has potential to like be viewed out differently. And I'm like, I can do that, you know, like with DIY skate, for example, it was literally just like my relationship with Unit 2, I was there a lot and they noticed that I picked up skating. And can like, you hey, give context to what Unit 2 is? Unit 2 is the like OG DIY space in terms of our generation. Like they've been around for over a decade. They've really held it down. They've set the example for so many spaces, you know, like 187 and T-Base, for example, like they really like, are the elders and they're not even that old, <laughs> you know? Um, so through my relationship with them, which was actually independently found, like I was being some some artist's shorty for one night and ended up at Unit 2. And um, I ended up coming again back to Unit 2 through T-Base. And I was like, hey, I know this place. Hey, this is cool. And I also was part of a... Um, online virtual tonic to the initial pandemic called cooler fet with max hole shout out max and <laughs> uh yeah through my like um occupying space there like there was like hey there's this dude that like paints that curb and is skating it and then i ended up skating with him and he's like i got some skate features like a quarter pipe and stuff and i'm like yeah i got like a rail you know we should bring this together and then next thing you know we have djs 60 plus people outside you know people skating, taking up the street and like reclaiming the land that we've just resigned to cars. You know, it's like, I really love skateboarding as a, a framework for like looking at cities. Because cities are mm -hmm. so often designed without interaction in mind. It's kind of like, you can look at it, but don't touch it, you know? Um, and as a kid that got told that a lot, I need to touch it. You know, I need to, I need to like see that sculpture by some dude at the OCAD and like, I want to skate it. I want to see what I can do. I want to like challenge what this was meant for. What I love about DIY skate is that, and I love it when you talk about this, I'm gonna ask you one last question, I swear. Um, DIY skate is so queer and it's so gay. And I, I love the way you talk about how it came about that way. Cause DIY skate is not, doesn't have like DIY skate, like queer and trans people only. Like, I love it. I love the way that it just, can you talk about it? I love what I okay, love. I would just have to say that we're leaving identity <laughs> politics in 2020, first of all. 
I thought you left it. My God. No, people Please. are still going for it. And I just I just say that in the sense that like identity-based spaces are not it because there's no yeah. one identity that is inherently more or less harmful than the other. And it only mm. serves to like make events truly exclusive because you are doing that by only making it for certain people. So I really focused on DIY skate being a value-based event. Mm. And it really beautifully manifested because skating for the most part and a lot of sports in general, I would say are very like male dominated and white male dominated. And, you know, you can add cis and heterosexual too, because that's also true. And what was really beautiful is through my community building uh, over my course of like my skate career, I guess, um, I just had those relationships and I wanted those people to come out. And it was really beautiful because it wasn't just queer people. Like yeah. they were the straight man from Scarborough that pulled up and they were on their best behavior. And I even talked to like most of them. <laughs> and if anything, this really bridges the gap for the next time, maybe they will start interacting more. Yeah. And then because ultimately like lambasting or like villainizing the privileged demographics only serves to alienate us more, you know? And like, mm. I really think we need to have connection more than anything else. And like, I'm not saying put up with the bullshit far from that. I, I'm the last person to put up with bullshit. But it's like, yo, if you're coming here with like the right values and the right ideas, you're welcome here. And as long as you and, uphold that, you're welcome here. And that's like a metaphor for Chinatown. Like, mm. what are Chinatown's values? I don't mm. care if you're Chinese or not. You know what I mean? Like, I could give less of a fucking shit. Like, if you are down for like sex workers and like working class immigrants and like the most marginalized people and like amplifying and building these relationships like that to me is like the future of chinatown you know and like i don't know but that just this just gets me so like it just gets me going man <laughs> because i just want to texturize that even further because I've, i'm so tired of conversations um because i organize so much in the uh lgbtq community and specifically, like, I name it LGBTQ because the conversation is tired, um, which is around the loss of queer and specifically, like, gay and lesbian-only spaces. And I've all, for so long, I didn't know if I could contribute in a way that was beyond the identity-based, mm -hmm. like, lens, where mm -hmm. you know, I, I understand then that need for um for those only spaces but at the same time i i was noticing around me the emergence of like diy spaces where there's so much queer and trans and sex work acceptance where it's just like integrated and embedded in diy culture where i was not seeing that level of openness in like let's say like lesbian only or like gay only mm -hmm. Um, spaces, which is not a diss to them because there is a need for all of, for different kinds of spaces, right? Um, but the conversation just never went quite as deep as I wanted it to. Yeah. I really like queerness in that lens because like as much yeah. as it's tacked onto LGBT, um, for me, queerness is something that refuses to be defined. Yeah. And like through Queering Chinatown, it's like, we we aren't it's it's not like oh well you know everyone has to like this type of thing or be the, into this sexuality or this kind of person it's like mm -hmm. you carve out a space for yourself you bring who you are your full self yeah. and like we will work with you we will be in community with you and like i really love queerness as like a catch-all and i know there is lots of discourse in the community about <laughs> queerness especially the older generation still don't feel comfortable with it the mm -hmm. newer ones do and it's kind of like this age divide, but it's just like, for me, queerness really just encapsulates. It's like, it's full stop because I don't need to like give you every nuance about exactly, how it, because exactly. it changes in, within me day to day. You know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I really want to address Ollie's comment. Hi, Ollie. I love you. So what <laughs> happens when those spaces become predominantly white? So I feel like, again, it goes back to relationships. If you have the relationships and you've, you're ba building that base, it's never going to become predominantly white. Unit yes. 2 has been around for over almost a decade, over almost a decade. Well, it's, almost never, it's never going to become predominantly white because those are not the relationships that Unit 2 has nourished. You know and what priorities. I mean? And prioritized. Yeah. And I would also add, like, you know, I, I think about some of the org. I, I totally agree with you. Like, you know, if we're if you're doing and if you're centering your values, the white people in the group will know how to what space they're taking up too, right? Mm -hmm. I think about like I'm, I'm gonna. Well, 
Just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> I'm very cynical. Today. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, Hania and Jay, like Jay, you're talking about connection, and Hania, you're talking about relationships too. One thing that LB from Van City, he's a co op developer that we've been working with, he said that I'm going to quote for the rest of my life. <laughs> and oh, that it, co ops move at the speed of trust. And so, if we're just focusing on all of like the organizing and I've applied this in like so much other, other stuff, especially during COVID where we can't, I can't be in, like I can't commune with people, if you will, it's all through the screen. And there's been, I've, I've noticed a couple of times like in, in some of my other, in, at school, for example, you know, we, in our organizing, there's been a conversations of like, oh, let's just skip the virtual happy hours. You know, we can't, you know, it's, we have too much organizing to do. And I was like, well, we, there's no other space for us to build a build relationship if we're not just if we're just focusing on the organizing mm -hmm. and we're not thinking about also the relationship pieces that are that are happening like those things have have to happen together if not i would argue the relationship pieces mm -hmm. more so yeah well it's like um, what are we doing it for right if we're just organizing yeah. organizing organizing it's like yeah where where's not not the angle because i don't think there is ever a true angle but it's like are we like we're trying to improve conditions and bring ourselves together but it's like once we brought ourselves together what we're just like sitting in a room awkwardly like against the wall listening to the music you know like you know we gotta like intermingle you know it's like this isn't like a straight man's club you know like we don't we don't want that yeah and yeah. people think it's like oh because we're doing serious work we this can't be fun and it's like right. It's no, not, no, no. Yeah, those, these two things can exist it's like i feel like i center so much fun and intentionally choose joy you know mm -hmm. like like that's a very di like dis like what's the word i'm looking for like it's a very uh words it's a decision it's a radical move it's, it's a radical a decision. decision yeah yeah it's a very like a, a intentional boom words mm -hmm. it's a very intentional choice to center joy and fun and like everything i do really is like how can i bring people together because when people come together like mahjong monday because when people come together, Focht gets born. When we make a garden, you know what I mean? Like Focht gets born again. It's like, uh, yeah. it's really like, if you just bring people together, they so naturally want to do stuff together and take care of each other and love each other. If you feed everyone and you make it fun, the organizing will come. Mm. You know? Now, my question back to you is um, with this unique year, this past year, where we can't have the usual group of people, community, beaming feedback and beaming that relationality back at us. So I found this past year particularly difficult in the sense that I was experiencing all sorts of self-doubt. I, I was just, I feel very dumb for lack of a better word. I felt like I was stumbling through my words. I, I just felt like uh, an imposter i was like the, at an all-time high i felt like an imposter you know um and i realized and it was my dear friend anna white who's the camp director of camp out which is the um only queer youth camp in bc um she was telling me it's because you don't have these people in person like beaming like positivity and joy back to you um and so how has it been for t-base being, you know, stuck in lockdown? Like how has organizing been for all of you? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fucking hard, you know? Like we also got Reno evicted um, yeah. out of our unit. So like our literal space was taken away from us. I think the base building and the energy definitely went more into Focked, who does way more like political advocacy. And like, we did a lot of surprisingly a lot of base building at Focht and we did like socially distanced gardening and like I'm really proud of Focht because we started off at the beginning of the pandemic we were like we're all fucked let's start having like bi-weekly meetings <laughs> we need this you know and so we started off the pandemic being like we're just kind of like we don't have seniors and like residents we don't have that base building how can we do this during the pandemic and a year later it's been so amazing like we've been like working with food banks we've been canvassing we built relationships with like cecil center we have like mini language clubs inside what? now we have like mm. we have language like, and we've onboarded almost like 
40 new people into Focked during a pandemic. So while T-Base, I think is definitely was like, we're in transition, we're becoming a co-op, we're doing a lot of internal kind of dialogue. I think Focked really like, we really did the work um, mm -hmm. this pandemic and it was hard and it was difficult. Like I haven't seen other Focked members in a year and it's i'm really proud of us it's been i don't know it's difficult and um i miss it i also like just in general feel like an imposter all the time jen so i definitely <laughs> understand like as a very relational community oriented person like what i'm hearing about yourself it's like it's hard it's really hard not to have like relationships all around us all the time because that's how we like survive you know so yeah. i really feel you on that i really feel you on that mm -hmm. We're running out of time. How did that happen? How did that happen? We could talk forever. Yeah. I feel we, we didn't ask you the question we ask everyone though. So I feel we should ask that question. <laughs> and that's, um, what what's your relationship with Hot Pot and what's your favorite ingredient and why? Oh, I love this question. Do you and I have a feeling that Hanya's and mine is the exact same because we possibly talked about this before. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, I guess I grew up hot potting like most families. And then when tea Bay started, I was like, let's hot pot. So we would have like all these dinners. We had um, an event called Hot Pot Potluck Art Fuck. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Amazing. Amazing. We I'm have so event. jealous. <laughs> so it was would bring their own ingredient and then we would hot pot and then make art after. And then when we were like the co-op group has been so amazing. Um, we've onboarded like 10, like eight people just for this, for our co-op development. Um, and we were joking around about how like, we want to really like language is so important, you know? And we were like, let's stop calling them boards. Why are they mm. called directors and boards? Like it's so ugh, it's so hierarchical. So we were like, why don't we call the? And we haven't formalized it yet. It hasn't been form like decided. But like we were like, why don't we call the board like hot pot? And then each member is like an ingredient. <gasps> or, like, no we call the, or like we call the board like soup base, and then everyone is like a different ingredient because every ingredient is important. No one ingredient is better than the other. Um, so that was a really cute, and we would call like our um, AGMs, like uh, like a family dinner. Like we just call it, like we're gonna gather and have a meal and vote on shit. And um, my favorite hot pot ingredient is uh, anoki mushroom. I just like. I love it. it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Is it? Your, yeah, we are. Yeah, uh, David, I can see it on your face, but you and I are both so I'm jealous. That we didn't well, I'm like, that idea. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna steal this. I'm We're gonna, gonna steal this. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> hey, this is DIY. There's no stealing. It's just horizontal. As yeah. long as you give credit, Informed, no yeah. one cares. Yeah. Like you know? maybe yours will actually live on to be more than one singular event, you know? That <laughs> and Jay, how about you? Um, so I got to give more context to my background. Um, I, my mom is fully Chinese, but like culturally, she's a Caribbean mother. Like I grew up with like chicken curry, stew chicken, Creole chicken. Like, you know, um, my mom never taught me, but was taught how to like kill a chicken from scratch and like skin it and everything. So like I grew up in a lot more of like a Caribbean, like cultural um, palette. So it wasn't really until I came to T-Base, I really had hot pots and i guess this may be a bit of a subversion or a cop-out but i would say my favorite ingredient is the chili oil <laughs> yes like, which, which it one is though which one with all the chili oil <laughs> yeah. cool and i can add it to my own taste you know it's like off to the side and i just put it in but oyster mushrooms if if we gotta like keep it <laughs> keep it what stays in the pot you know sauce is important sauce stays mm -hmm. Sauce yeah. is forever. Juice is temporary. Sauce is forever. Boom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> well, I've, 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 you know, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I didn't actually didn't grow up with um, hot pot. And, you know, I was thinking about this because I've mentioned this in a, a previous hot pot talks, but it was really like, I think for my family, it just was very excessive. Like my, you know, my, my, I don't want to like, we, we didn't grow up poor. I didn't grow up poor, but my, my parents, 
and their parents grew up very, very, very poor. And so this idea of having more than three, like you, you got to feed the family, but like you, the, we, the, we got to save money. <laughs> so the idea of having like 10 different ingredients is just excessive, right? <laughs> and I think that was sort of, and, so, and I remember discovering hot pot when I was in high school, you know, going out with my friends and then bringing it, it like bringing it sort of back, I guess you could say, or re re reviving the tradition in my family. And now it's like a competition of like how many, how, how much, how much more things we can have yeah. on the table, right? How <laughs> hot is your pot? Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's five of us and like, we always like debate over like soup bases. So my mom at one point bought two, like divided, like two things. So we would basically have our own like section. So there'd be four, <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> Jen, how about you? <laughs> Uh, sorry, I totally spaced out just now. Um, my hot pot, I, I grew up loving hot pot. It's like totally in my family. Um, in Taiwan and in Canada, we would try to replicate like the Taiwanese like hot pot, which we would like, it's like all year round, you would eat it in summer too, to get like the excess heat off. Um, so it's been super ingrained in my family for as long as I can remember. And that's why we asked this question because everybody's origin story is different with mm -hmm. hot pot. Um, and it's such a nice way of, you know, subverting that the, the, the perception that people have of like East Asians or like Chinese people as like a monolith, you know, we all have very, very different stories ultimately. Um, I want to thank you, Jay and Hania. Thank you both so much for joining us live. I know it's been a hard <laughs> day. Um, lots of tears today. Um, but I want to, yeah, thank you and for showing up with your all today. Um, David, should we announce our next guest? Yeah. One sec. Um, yeah, uh, next week our guest, um, oh, I, my, now my mind is blank. <laughs> our next well, week our guest. really beautifully to Jay because. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So next week, our guest is um, the PhDJ, uh, Dr. <laughs> Tao Li Goff, um, who, and the, it, it's going to be sponsored, uh, co-sponsored by um, the Afro-Asia Working Group at Yale University. Um, and we're going to, we're going to be picking up on these conversations about uh, Chinatowns. Um, yeah, we're super, super, super excited about that. Um, Tune yeah. in to us next Wednesday, same time, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Um, subscribe to us on YouTube. That's the easiest way to get um, live updates. Great. Have a, have a good night. Bye.